Hello, everybody, and welcome to this conversation. Um, thank you for those who have been holding on the line. We are just about to kick off. We're just going to give everyone two or three minutes just to get into the room. I know usually when people enter rooms such as this, um, the first thing you are asked to do is to tell us where you are coming from. But I'm sure we've all been doing a lot of Zoom calls over the last six, seven months, and you've probably had quite enough of telling people your city. So I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit more work today. Um, not only am I gonna ask you to tell us where you are coming from so that we can really know if Pan-Africanism is still alive, so we can see where everybody's coming from. Um, and also to give um, our um, speaker today, Dr. Beckles, the opportunity to know who he's speaking to, where everyone's coming from. Um, but I would also like you to include in your introduction, when you tell us where you're coming from, and um, what reparations means to you when you think about it, because it probably means something slightly different to everybody. Um, is it, I don't want to put any ideas in anybody's mind, actually. So please do um, get typing, um, introduce yourselves, tell us where you're coming from, and also what reparations means to you. I think that will really help our speaker this evening to, to gauge um, what's in, in the mindset of the people who are here. And while that is happening, I'm going to give everyone the opportunity to join us. So bear with me for another one to two minutes. Hi, Nigel, I know you <laughs> from Hitchin. Thank you so much. That's um, from London, Jamaica from Detroit. Um, hello, Jamaica. Reparations is a debt owed to all Africans. Okay, interesting. So I think we'll, um, perhaps in, um, in Dr. Beckel's conversation today, we might start to unearthed ideas about Africans or who, who are Africans, especially in this idea of global um, Africa that Dr. Beckles touches on in his um, essay. Um, Eric from London, no real understanding of reparations. Okay, so the big, big task today. So not only are you here to, to talk about or to learn about Durban, but also to actually get some definitions about reparations. Um, um, Adeoye, reparations is making atonement for the grave sins of slavery, colonialism, and theft. I love the exclamation mark um, there. Thank you very much. So atonement, I love that kind of value judgment coming in here as well. Um, Stephen um, says, it means I worked for you. Now it's time to pay what you owe me. Um, so that's, um, I think, uh, a, a, a really um, nice idea that fits with the idea of reparatory justice, which I think the, the wording that's often used um, when Dr. Beckles and his colleagues write and speak and meet and discuss this matter. Please do keep your um, comments coming in. Um, I'm gonna start speaking now in the formative part of um, my conversation, introducing Dr. Beckles, but um, that doesn't mean you should stop because once I finish speaking, I'm gonna come back into the chat um, and just sum up before handing over to to um, Dr. Beckles this evening. So I'm gonna start formally now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this next installment of the Pan-African Pantheon Lecture Series hosted by the Center of Pan-African Thought in collaboration with the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation. My name is Apeke Molu, and I am the director of the African History Project, a new specialist school of black history, political thought, and culture. It is a deep honor for us at the project to have been asked by Nigel and the team here at the center to chair this series of conversations. As many of you will know, this series is in celebration and support of Professor Adebayo's seminal work, the edited collection, The Pan-African Pantheon, released earlier this year. The collection is a unique and powerful contribution to scholarship, a work in which leading contemporary Pan-Africans write on the lives and works of leading Pan-Africans of the past and present. If you haven't gotten your copy already, we'll be pasting a link in the chat to the purchase page with a discount code. So you're very lucky. And um, so please do go ahead and grab yourself a copy before we um, wrap up proceedings this evening. I'm gonna speak for a few minutes, as I said, to warm everybody up um, before handing over to Sir Hilary. 
with whom I will be discussing his important contribution to this collection, in which he not only gives a history of Pan-African sentiment in the Caribbean, but also details how such sentiment was shaken by the Durban Conference of 2001. Though Sir Hillary needs no introduction, it is my and the Centre's deep honour to give you a brief introduction to our main speaker this evening. A Bayesian, Sir Hillary has dedicated his career to telling the history of his formidable island, Barbados, to the world. Though not the biggest island in the Caribbean, through Sir Hillary's work, the world has come to understand that it is perhaps the island with the biggest story to tell, being as it is, as it, as it was and is, the first real slave state of the new world. An economist by training, Sir Hillary is both a professor at and the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies. For anyone who has had the pleasure of reading Professor Beckel's work, I'm sure you will agree that, and I hope he will be nothing but honored in my saying that, he is a writer of the CLR James Persuasion, writing with an unmatched passion and realness about, what for, about that for which he's deeply passionate. My favorite title of his, and the one that I teach on my programs, is The First Black Slave Society, Britain's Barbarity, Barbarity Time in Barbados, 1636 to 1876. But it is not for his work in unearthing history, but his activism in asking others to account for it that brings Sir Hillary to us here today. A member of the UN Science Advisory Board on Sustainable Development, as well as an advisor to UNESCO's Global Programme and World Culture Report, I hope Sir Hillary will agree that in his appointment as chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, his training as an economist, his career as a historian, and his activism for the West to account for its history in the Caribbean, all come together in the formidable task of seeking reparatory justice for the industrial enslavement and colonization of Africans in the diaspora. I very much look, look forward to dissecting his chapter after his lecture today. Before I hand over to Sir Hilary, I'm just going to read a few more of the comments um, about where people are coming from. So um, Kamal, who's residing in the UK, is seeking to gain more understanding or overstanding, I love that, in regards to reparations. And Nobantu, a student from South Africa, is undergoing a continuous progress of land, so it believes it's undergoing a continuous progress of land redistribution. The challenge is whether our reparation will be with or without compensation. So I'll pick up a little bit more of these, but I hope that's giving you, um, Sir Hillary, a little bit of an introduction into um, the sorts of ideas people have about what reparations mean. And also that many of us are coming to this conversation not quite sure what it means as well. Um, so without further ado, I am truly honored to say, please, this is now your time, sir. Uh, thank you so much, madam. Thank you so very much for your kind, your kind comments and your your introductory context and thanks for creating the environment within which I can engage our, our friends and our colleagues in this, in this conversation. And I say conversation because I, I, I don't imagine this to be a lecture. I, I, I imagine this to be an ongoing dialogue with Pan-Africanists and, and others uh, and all of those who are forging what is becoming increasingly known as a, a global Africa sensibility and, and cosmology. So thank you all for uh, being a part of this. For me, it's a tremendous honor uh, also, also to be celebrating the magisterial uh, work on the Pan-African Pantheon by Professor Adair Adebayo, who's my old buddy, my old friend and uh, uh, a colleague with whom I have maximum respect and, uh, and, and solidarity. So to be, to be continuing in this conversation around the Pan-African Pantheon is really a tremendous, a tremendous, tremendous honor. And as always, I, I, I begin by noting that this conversation is one in which I feel as if I have been a witness to, to three aspects of this of the dialogue. One, I am an archival researcher and much of my understanding of this subject, uh, the historical context and background of course, emerge out of my own, my own research as an archival, archival historian. But secondly, I also was a diplomat participating in the dialogue at Durban and there I was 
acts by the governments of the Caribbean, the English speaking Caribbean, the Commonwealth Caribbean, I, I was invited to, uh, to represent them in the plenary dialogue uh, with the, the Western world uh, around the issue of, of crimes against humanity, uh, reparatory justice, reparations for enslaved Africans. So yes, I took off my historian's hat and, and wore the diplomat uh, hat during that conference. Uh, and then after I took off that hat and became uh, an advocate around the conversations that took place at the conference. So I moved from the historian to the diplomat to the advocate. And what I want to do therefore is to, is to bring those three realities to converge them into this conversation and to share uh, over the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, the significance of those three very important experiences. Now, I wish to speak about the relationship between uh, Pan-Africanism, how it evolved, how it developed, our understanding of it, its seminal and seismic impact upon the world. And I wish to speak about the testing of the assumptions and the values of Pan-Africanism insofar as they were put on trial uh, at the Durban conference in 2001, when the United Nations gathered the world to discuss slavery, crimes against humanity, and issues of atonement. Uh, that's very, very uh, significant uh, in, in, in indeed. But I begin with the historical perspective, which would suggest, you know, that it, it really has been a uh, a four, 500 year journey, uh, African peoples uh, around the world scattered uh, through the globalization of chattel slavery and how African peoples found themselves all over the world. Uh, certainly they were traveling around the world before the impact of Western colonization and, and imperialism. But uh, what imperialism did was to intensify that migration, uh, criminalize that migration, and created the crime against humanity, which was this, the scattering of black people in chains around the world. And you know, the, the image of it is very important. The, the image of a planet, the image of a planet, and on every continent are Africans who are enchained. So one can actually see the enchaining of the planet through black bodies, with black bodies, creating this iron clad set of matrices across the world. And poetically, when one think of the globalization of chattel slavery, that's what one sees, chains everywhere, chains, black bodies, and chains every, everywhere. And indeed, there were, there were everywhere. Of course, what one would expect is how that struggle to break those chains would have emerged and how those African peoples on a global scale uh, took on struggles of multiple characters to end that process and to, and to, and to reestablish the, the reality of, of, one's, of, of one's freedom. Now, there, there are moments when we realize how fragmented knowledge of that, of that global struggle uh, became. So I will give you an example. Um, uh, over a decade ago, um, I was invited by the university, the Kwame Nkrumah University in Ghana, uh, Kumasi, to give a lecture on Ashanti, Ashanti organized Ashanti rebellions against slavery in the Caribbean. And I, I chose to spoke about the, the, six, the 1763 Kofi, uh, Kofi Kingdom, in which the, uh, the Ashantis uh, in, in the Burbese province of Guyana uh, overthrew 
uh, the Dutch slavery regime defeated the English collaborators and declared an African kingdom and declared an Ashanti kingdom under King Kofi. And this was after months of bloody military warfare. So the, the Ashantis prevailed and there was a ceremony of the stool and uh, Kofi became the Asante, the Asante Hini of Barbies, of Guyana. So here we are uh, in this part of the world, in the Americas. And we know there's now an Asante kingdom. There's an Asante Hini. There's an Atumfo. Uh, the kingdom is declared. And that is what we have. Now, what I realized was I was speaking in an audience of Asantes, largely Asantes, uh, in the great hall of the university. And no one in the audience, no one in the audience in the heart of the Ashanti world knew that there was an Ashanti kingdom fought for and won and declared in Guyana. No one, 2,000 people, didn't know that their ancestors had created a replica of their own Asante kingdom with an Asante Hini, a tumfo, a ceremony of the stool, and all of that had happened. And no one in Asante knew about it. Then I came to realize the extent to which it seemed that for, from the point of view of African historians, that when African people took that first step off the coast of Africa, took that step onto the slave ship, that to a large extent, there was a, a rupture, a fundamental rupture that you would then be written out of your history. So these Asantes in Guyana who yearned for home and had reproduced home in another continent were written out of history by their own scholars back home. Written out of history. They had lost their identity. They were no longer Africans. They were on another continent. They were enchained and therefore their historical narrative have to be the narrative of the Americas and not the narrative of Asante, not the narrative of Africa, but the narrative of the Americas. These are seriously disturbing circumstances for me as a historian, especially given the fact that we can break up our Pan-African journey into three distinct phases. And this first phase, which was to uproot slavery, and uh, there was not there was not a generation of enslaved Africans in the Americas that did not take up arms to end their enslavement and declare their freedom. We, we speak of the Haitian Revolution and we know of it, that this was the first successful and sustained war upon slavery. It was a Pan-African war because those Africans who led that war, some of them were from the Congo, Many were from uh, the Asante. Many of them were uh, Fulani. And of course, there were also the uh, large group of people who had come out of Nigeria, out of the, the land uh, in, of, the, of the Delta area. So if you look at the leadership of the Haitian Revolution, you will find that there were Africans from all over West and Southwest Africa. So when you speak of it, it really in and of itself, it was a Pan-African organization and struggle and victory. So it was the victory of all the Africans uh, on that island that Haiti was a part of, but when the Haitians took over the other part of the island, then it was an island that was a genuine Pan-African state. And we have several small examples of this. Um, we have many examples of <laughs> Igbos and uh, uh, also the Fulanis and the Ga and the Mandingo coming together to organize political strategies 
in order to pursue objectives. So we know that Pan-African history is deeply rooted in the earliest stages of the struggle of African people. It meant they had to collaborate. It meant they had to organize. It meant they had to think through beyond their own ethnic identity and merge multiple identities into a common forge. So we know the history and we know the background, but we also know that that, we could say, uh, that process uh, can be classified as the organizational framework up to the end, up to the beginning of the 20th century. In the 20th century, we know it exploded into an intellectual force, the literature, the art, uh, the philosophy, the political thinking, and we then crafted onto that uh, an epistemology of African thinking about itself. But within that context, uh, there was to some extent, to, there was to some extent uh, a reversal. And I, I wish to be very clear on the specifics of this notion of reversal. In the so-called diaspora, when all of the African ethnic groups were forging this political movement to build out a liberation culture in the Americas. When the attention, when the attention began to focus more specifically, when the attention began to focus more specifically on the liberation of Africa itself, ending uh, colonization in Africa, and allowing nation building to erupt in Africa, ending the apartheid situation, nation building citizenship, driving the European colonialists out of Africa. Then at that stage, we began to see the polarity of the diaspora and the Africa, the Africans at home and the Africans abroad. And the language began to take the shape of polarity of Africans at home and Africans uh, abroad. The core, which is Africa, and the diaspora, which is uh, elsewhere. But that was not a feature of the first phase. The first phase was indeed the phase that is driven by what became known as creolity. That the fact is that all of these African ethnic groups were being creolized into a polyglot culture. So that the parameters of African ethnicity were melting away and morphing into a broader concept, which was also taking place in Africa, but actually but became the focus of what the diaspora was all about. And then Pan-Africanism in its second phase evolved into these polarities, that the Africans in the diaspora, that their primary duty and function is to create the intellectual, organizational, and then the military framework to struggle for African liberation, African independence, citizenship, nationhood, ending the colonial era, driving imperialism out of Africa, that became the primary focus. And it is within that context that most of us today came to understand what Pan-Africanism really is and has been all about. I maintain it had very deep roots, but one can understand how in the 20th century, it took the form that we now all understand. Now, it was against that background, of course, that we arrived in Durban in 2001 to, within the context of the United Nations, to speak about reparatory justice as the ultimate phase in Pan or, the, or the next phase, I should say, in Pan-Africanist thinking. So yes, the Pan-Africans said, we have, we have fought and won for the liberation of Africa uh, and, south, and, uh, and the Southwest and the Southeast and the South and West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, and we have driven the imperialists out of Africa. We have nation states, we have citizenship, major triumph for Pan-Africanism and at every intellectual dimension, including, as I have said, go into battle. The people of the Caribbean felt very proud, especially so, 
the people of the diaspora, the Caribbean and the United States especially, felt very, very proud that certainly from the point of view of being the intellectual giants who conceptualize and theorize this Pan-African unity vision for the world and laid the foundation for a passionate commitment to driving imperialism out of Africa. And the Caribbean, of course, had produced uh, the Cuban intervention, which was critical to the fall of apartheid and the end of colonialism uh, in, 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 in Southern Africa. So the Caribbean peoples felt a sense of centrality, not only at the intellectual level, you mentioned Sierra Leone James and all of the great thinkers, Padmore, uh, Fans, Fanon, all of those great intellectuals. But in addition to the intellectualism around Pan-Africanism, sending soldiers into Southern Africa, thousands of Caribbean people died in that Southern African struggle. So it was a case that the Caribbean was not just <coughs> with formulating a philosophy of Pan-Africanism, Pan the Caribbean was going to put the soldiers behind their philosophy. And thousands of Caribbean people through the Cuban moment intervene in Southern Africa. Those planes will come to Barbados and from Barbados they will refuel, from Guyana they will refuel and they will leave Havana, come through the islands, collect their fuel on the way to West Africa, to South Africa to get the job done. It was a Caribbean effort to, to put the gun at the center of the philosophy to end the crime of colonization in South Africa. So against that background, the Caribbean delegation arrived uh, in Durban uh, to, shape, to shape that conference at which reparatory justice was, was, was placed at the center. And it was placed at the center by African delegates, Caribbean delegates, Latin American delegates, uh, your American delegates, who in the preliminary safety insisted that reparations uh, ought to be a critical issue there. But we arrived and found that there was a huge diplomatic crisis uh, facing the conference. And <clears throat> if reparations was going to stay on the agenda, the Americans have already said they were, pull they were pulling out of the conference if reparations was on the agenda. And you must remember that the Americans are being represented at this historic <clears throat> moment by two very prominent African-Americans. General Colin Powell and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Two very prominent black political operatives made it clear that if reparatory justice is on the agenda, they will be pulling the US out of it. So imagine then how the Caribbean delegates felt when that was being done to them by fellow African Americans. That was a very painful experience. Arise in Africa, in Southern Africa, to find that the British delegation was being led by another prominent black woman, Baroness, Baroness Amos, representing the British Labour Party government at that conference. And so we, the Caribbean delegates, arriving in Southern Africa to discuss repartory justice for black people, found that Britain had a head of delegation who made it clear that Britain had done nothing wrong. Slavery was legal. There's no need for apology. And therefore there was no need for reparatory justice. And that was Britain's position articulated by a black political operative. The Americans had pulled out 
recommendation of other black operatives. So Pan-Africanism was facing a major formal crisis in the sense that from our point of view, the, the dagger in the back was coming from the black representatives of powerful North Atlantic states, the United States and, and Britain. But we soldiered on uh, into the conference and in order to save the conference, because Mbeki, President Mbeki had instructed us, the Caribbean, the Caribbean delegates uh, through um, Secretary, Foreign Secretary uh, Zuma. And she met with us and uh, it was clear that, it was clear from the narrative with her that the Africans were not with us. Uh, it was clear that South Africa was not with us. Nigeria was not with us. Senegal was not with us. And Ghana uh, was not with us. And President Abosanjo, Nigeria was clear, he was not with us. President Wad, Senegal, clear. And uh, President Kufo, Ghana. So the Caribbean delegation was caught between a rock and a hard place. We were jammed by the British government as represented by Baroness Amos, a black woman. We were jammed by the Americans because of two black operatives called Colonel pa General Powell and Condoleezza Rice. And now in Africa, we are jammed by the countries, by the political leaders of the countries where the vast majority of the Africans in the Caribbean came from. The vast majority of the Africans in the Caribbean came out of Senegambia, they came out of Ghana, they came out of the Nigerian hinterland. And the leadership of those areas broke with us in the diaspora. So we were, we were on our own. We were on our own. And it was difficult. It was difficult. The African leadership was very aggressive in that regard. They made it clear to us that they were in pursuit of the African Renaissance. And the African Renaissance document, and I recall having access to a document that was describing the African perception of its, of its development paradigm and they spoke of the Renaissance. And when I read it, it, it resonated with me really as a World Bank perspective on African development. It, it certainly contained the concepts and the language of a World Bank narrative on how Africa should look at its future. So that was the context within which the Durban Conference will always be known historically. That was a conference in which African leaders broke with the Caribbean on what we thought was the most important issue of the day, which is the reparatory justice for the globalization of slavery, the slave trade, and the subsequent colonization uh, of, of, of Africa. There were some very hard lessons uh, to be learned. We presented um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the plenary that Britain, for example, had 200 years of free labor from 20 million people. So if you extracted free labor from 20 million people over 200 years, if you were to even to find a way to quantify that, you will get a sense of the parameter of what Britain had extracted from the free labor of slavery. And if you take Britain and then multiply that by France, by Germany, by Spain, by Portugal, by Russia, by Switzerland, all of the countries of Western Europe that were a part of this 
architecture of criminality. Uh, when you have countries like Switzerland who were in the finance part of it, uh, when you had uh, the, 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 the Russians and the Germans who were putting companies together to get piece of the action, because all of this operation was taking place, is that slavery and slave trading are the biggest global business and everyone, everyone wants a piece of it. So even if you had no colony, you want a piece of the finance, you want a piece of the shipping, you want a piece of the insurance. You want a piece of it because it's a complex, multi-dimensional operation. So our African governments, when it came to the choice, should reparatory justice stay on the agenda or not? The Western world said it must, it must not be a part of the deliberations that are legally binding. The African leaders, one by one, voted with the West. So we are in a plenary in which our presidents, Abosanjo and Wade and Kufo and all of the others are voting with the West against the Caribbean that reparatory justice should stay on the agenda and be a conversation. A lot of very important language was used to describe that. Some people describe it as betrayal, that the African leaders had betrayed the diaspora. Uh, some people said it's the end of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is dead because now we have come to the fountain. We've come to the snake head. And rather than cut off the head of the snake, the African leaders back down and allowed the snake to continue. Some people spoke of a moral crisis. This is a, this is a crisis of morality. You know, that the Caribbean and the diaspora had, had come to this very place called Southern Africa and had shed their blood to free in a Pan-Africanist solidarity. They did it in Angola and Mozambique and Namibia. They did this because Pan-Africanism was at work. And then suddenly, Africa had received what it wanted. It slammed the door, told the diaspora to go away, and they voted block by block with the West against us. However, we took comfort in the fact that civil society in Africa was with the diaspora that there was a civil society conference taking place at, and the NGOs, the grassroots organizations, the trade unions, the church, academia, that the civil society structures of Africa broke with their own states and supported the diaspora. But they were not in the room, they were in a neighboring building expressing solidarity with the diaspora, while their governments were in the intergovernmental plenary building, socking it to the Caribbean. So that was another layer of complexity. But we took tremendous comfort in knowing that civil society, the youth, the trade unions, the educators, the church, the theologians, the grassroots organizations involved in public health and all of these other institutions that they stood their ground and rallied around the diaspora in support of reparations, even though their own governments were opposing us. But we know that from time to time, citizens stand up against their states and support progressive causes while their governments are supporting conservative causes. I have heard an argument that said that those African states uh, were being practical, being realistic, and that they thought it was appropriate to take half of a loaf. This is not true. There was no half of a loaf. When, when we argued in light of the fact that the African states were not supporting reparatory justice at the conference and wanted it off the table, 
we opted instead for a language of retreat. So what the conference eventually agreed to was the notion that chattel slavery should be a crime against humanity, should have been, should, should have been a, a crime against humanity. If it was practiced today, it would be a crime against humanity. In other words, that resolution that carried the word should have been meant clearly that there was an agreement by the Western group and the African group that there is doubt as to whether at the time, at the time that these crimes were committed, whether in fact at that moment there were indeed crimes. And because of the leadership of President Ward and, and President Wade and, and President and Becky, they allowed that watery uh, environment to be created around the language. So we were pushing for the word were, that slavery, slave trading were crimes against humanity. What eventually we got was a resolution should have been a crime against humanity should. I remember giving a speech on the concept of should. I spoke for an hour on the word should. So divided we were. And, but that could only have happened in the context of Africa's retreat from the moment when it mattered most. Coming out of that conference, however, there was doubt as to whether Pan-Africanism can be in the future an activist philosophy. And many Pan-Africanists, including myself, became concerned that while Pan-Africanism will always be a magnificent philosophical and intellectual construct to guide our people as an activist paradigm of getting the work done, of getting the work done, whether it has a future and whether we should not replace it with something much more practical and much more realistic, something we call instead global Africa. Because we came to realize the fundamental flaw of Pan-Africanism. It was this perception somehow that Africans living on the Af African continent and Africans living on other continents were somehow involved in a hierarchical relationship. That Africans living on other con continents were somehow lesser than Africans living on the African continent. And this notion of lesser than, of different, created an instability in the Pan-Africanist concept. And so the question was asked, Nigeria is an African state. Jamaica is an African state. Barbados is an African state because the vast majority of the people on them are Africans. So why should one be called the core and the other the periphery? The core, the core and the periphery was always being translated into the pure and the creole. And somehow the Africans in Africa were the pure Africans and the Africans in the diaspora were Creoles. They were a mixture of different types of Africans. They had a mixture of all different tribal identities and somehow, and somehow the Africans in the Americas were Creoles. So we were a piece of Igbo, a piece of Yoruba, a piece of Fulani, a piece of Mandingo. We were a piece of everything, a polyglot. And therefore we are not a different kind of African, we were an inferior kind of African. And all of those conversations began to emerge. And therefore the conclusion that we came to that the word diaspora is now obsolete. Diaspora is obsolete. I no longer refer to myself as being in any African diaspora. I am an African who is from the Caribbean. I'm an African who lives in the Caribbean. I am, and the Caribbean is as legitimate part of the African world as the African states themselves. And therefore diaspora is a dead concept. If you want to ask yourself this question, do ask it. 
How long did it take the Americans to abandon the word diaspora? The American colonies were diasporas of Britain. They were diasporas of Britain. How long did it take them to realize that they're no longer British diasporas, but they are now a legitimate country in and of their right? So, diaspora is dead. Global Africa, global Africa is alive. And Pan Africanism has given birth to global Africa. And so, when I was asked by UNESCO to be one of the editors, of the General History of Africa series, I was invited to Addis to speak to the, the eight volumes of the General History of Africa that have been uh, published by UNESCO. I started by saying, we celebrate all of those brilliant African historians who decolonize the Eurocentric view of African history and have given the world these magnificent magisterial eight volumes of the general history in Africa, written by some of the finest African minds. Magnificent. But I had to offer a critique. I said, however, they are all written about Africans in Africa. They are written in a language and in a structure that the general history of Africa is about those Africans living on the continent. And the moment you step your foot off the coast of Africa, you have walked out of the history of Africa. You are no longer a part of African history. You are now a part of British history. You're now a part of American history. Uh, you're part of Asian history, but you're no longer within the parameters of African history because you have left the continent. So African history is about Africans living on the continent. I said, this cannot be true. I said, this cannot be true. How do we consider something as simple as this? There are more Africans who have migrated, who have migrated to the United States in the 20th century than Africans who were shipped out in chains in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. So we have this large block of Africans who were shipped out in chains out to the Americas to pick cotton, to work on sugar plantations. They were checked out to slave. But in the 20th century, more Africans left Africa voluntarily and migrated to the United States. So now we have two blocks of Africans in, in the United States those who came in chains and those who came with passports. How do we untangle all of this? So those who come, who came in with passports, some of them do believe, oh, we, we are Africans. We are not, we are not African-Americans. African-Americans came in chains, but we came through the airports. We came through the airports with a passport. So now we have this conversation. How do we, Think of that. So global Africa is attempting to treat with those matters because global Africa says, wherever Africans are building communities, building states, becoming citizens, and when they build countries as they do in the Caribbean, when they build large communities as they do in Brazil, the United States, and so on, the diaspora concept is too weak. It's too divisive. The pure and the unpure, the, the pure and the Creole, and all of these, all of these colonial constructs. <laughs> we have to get rid of them because they are now becoming divisive. Very, very divisive. They're not supportive of the struggle ahead of us. So I suggested to UNESCO that the ninth volume should not be called simply the general history of Africa. It should be called global Africa because we are going to study African people in China and Japan and Russia and Europe, Latin America, North America, the Caribbean, wherever African people have gone in this world and have rooted themselves down, this volume is going to capture global Africa. 
Some of them are living in states as minorities, but some of them are living as states as majorities. But wherever they are, global Africa is a concept that we are pushing to help us with the politics. So that if Nigeria and Jamaica want to go into a conversation about trade and business and tourism and investments and so on, let them do it as two equal, two equal African nations. Two equal African nations collaborating and partnering to build up an infrastructure of global African business, but let them function as equals, not core and periphery, not home and diaspora to equal African nations collaborating for the upliftment of mutual and mutual development. We are concerned with what happened in Cuba. The Cuban people gave up their lives for the liberation of Southern Africa, the diaspora so-called moving into Southern Africa. Angola, Mozambique now become powerful and important rich nation states. Where do they invest most of their foreign exchange? Portugal. Most of the wealth that is globally exported and, and the financial structures and the deposits and the banks and so on. Those very countries, Portugal refused to let them go. It took the diaspora to come and free those nations out of the clutches of the militarism of Portugal. And at the end of that process, Angola and Mozambique deposits all of their significant international trading connections and financial deposits in Lisbon, not in Havana to help the Cubans with tourism and agriculture and technology development. No, 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 Lisbon. So we had, we had that betrayal in Durban. And now we're having it when we study the economics of direct foreign investments and we look at Southern African investments in Lisbon, we see that there's a journey, there's a story, there's a narrative that can be told from Durban to Lisbon. What went wrong in Durban found expression in Lisbon. So we can now theorize the crumbling of Pan-Africanism in the narrative of the journey from Durban to Lisbon. And that is what we know. We were all hoping that the time would come when all of this would come together in a coherent way. And that is still what we are striving for. So global Africa becomes the organizational framework. Pan-Africanism has to step back and be what it probably was destined to be a great theoretical framework, consciousness, cosmology, epistemology, so that we intellectuals can theorize who we are as a people. It, it's still very relevant. But on the question of reparations, we have to part company. On the question of reparations, we have to part company. We are now, however, we have not given up. I have advised the CARICOM heads of governments that they should reach out to the African Union and organize a Caribbean, African-American, Africa summit on reparations in Africa. That Africans post-Durban should now host a global Africa summit, a global Africa summit in Africa under the auspices of the African Union. And that would heal, that would heal the womb of Durban. That Nigeria and Ghana and Southern Africa can all host this global summit where we can all come to Africa to talk about reparations and the 21st century and let it be a Pan-African conference, healing the wound of Durban so that we can get back on track and that global Africa can be seen to be practical, realistic, 
a structure for the future. So all of you in this conference, I would urge you, wherever you are, to give your support to this pressing and urgent concept of a reparatory justice summit in Africa, hosted by the African unions, allowing reparatory justice advocates and governments from all over the world to come to Africa to discuss the future. So yes, we are Pan-Africanists. And therefore, when we have setbacks, we don't give up. Durban to Lisbon has been a setback, but we have not given up. We have to heal this wound. It was 20 years ago, 20 years ago, but we have to heal it. And the way we can is to have this global summit on reparatory justice in Africa. That is where I would end my intervention. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it.